Good evening, Chesterfield. This is dark matter. Why is it dark and does it matter? So for nearly a hundred years now, we've known that the universe has a dark side. In this particular cartoon, the lecturer is saying, after the discovery of antimatter and dark matter, we have just confirmed the existence of doesn't matter, which does not have any influence on the universe whatsoever. Well, I hope to convince you this evening that dark matter does indeed have an influence on the universe. So when we think about the composition of matter, we've come to the conclusion that when we think about all the matter in the universe, we can divide it into the stuff we know about and the stuff we don't. And the stuff we know about is only about 16% of the total. So when we talk about matter that we are familiar with, what do we actually mean? What is that 16%? You might think most of it is stars in galaxies, but actually no. Stars only account for a relatively small fraction. Most of galaxies are actually made out of gas. And you can see here the fraction. Most of the universe is made of hydrogen and helium much of it left over from the Big Bang. Only a relatively small amount of it is actually locked up inside stars. And that final little wedge of 1%, that's other particles, some exotic particles, including neutrinos, which I'll come back to a little later in the talk. But the elephant in the room is, yeah, that's the 16%. That's the stuff we understand. But what is this 84% of all matter that we think exists? What is that stuff? That's what I'm talking about. This is dark matter. So I'm going to say a little bit about why it's dark, what evidence there is that dark matter exists. There's at least four strands of evidence, and I think I won't really have time to cover all of them deeply, so I'll just cover the first three strands, and the fourth I will include on a handout that I'll make available to John later. We can ask, what is it? If it exists, what is it? And there are a couple of possible candidates, which I'll explain as I go along. And then I'll finish with, well, does it actually matter? What if dark matter didn't exist? Would it make any material difference to the way the universe operates? So firstly, why is it dark? The simple answer is because it's not light, but that's a little bit fatuous. A more useful answer is it does not behave the same way as ordinary matter or normal matter, the sort of matter that makes up you and me and everything else we can see because normal matter interacts through what we call the electromagnetic force. In other words, it emits and absorbs electromagnetic radiation, what we would normally call light. And we're not too fussed whether we're talking about visible light or ultraviolet or infrared or radio. It doesn't matter which part of the electromagnetic spectrum we're talking about. We're talking about ordinary matter does emit and absorb electromagnetic waves and hence ordinary matter can be detected through its interaction with light. If the material is hot, it's luminous and it emits light, and if it's not hot and luminous, well, it might still absorb light and absorb stars that would otherwise be behind it so that we could see, for instance, dark nebulae, simply because it absorbs light from more distant stars. But dark matter does none of these things. It does not interact through the electromagnetic force and hence it does not absorb or emit electromagnetic waves. Everything we're used to in terms of normal matter, virtually everything that we understand is made of atoms. There are states of matter that don't involve atoms. We can separate the nucleus of an atom, a positively charged nucleus, from the negatively charged electrons that are buzzing around it. But virtually everything that we see around us is made from atoms, and atoms can emit or absorb light due to the way these electrically charged particles behave. And that's how we visualise atoms. It doesn't matter that that's not a particularly accurate representation. It's good enough for the time being. But if dark matter exists and does not emit or absorb light, then dark matter can't be made of atoms. It must be made of something else. And that is the big conundrum. So let's go through the pieces of evidence, at least the three strands of evidence that dark matter exists. The earliest strand of evidence comes from nearly a hundred years ago, looking at galaxies in clusters. 
we can ask the question, what holds galaxies together in clusters? When we look out into the universe, we see large numbers of examples of clusters and superclusters of galaxies. Here we see uh, an image. OK, there's some stars in the field of view, but most of what we're looking at here are galaxies. And if these clusters exist, and they certainly do, and they do in large numbers, something must be holding them together. It's very unlikely that we just happen to catch them at a time when they are drifting apart, so that we assume that if we see clusters of galaxies, something must be holding those galaxies in place. And what must that something be? Well, it's not a trick question. The something that's holding those galaxies together is gravity. There's nothing else we know of that can hold galaxies together in clusters of galaxies. Now, we know gravity depends on mass. And in terms of how do we weigh a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, well, we can get a pretty good approximation by saying that if we measure the galaxy brightness, if one particular galaxy happens to be shining with the luminosity of a billion stars, then we would guess that there might be a billion stars in that particular galaxy. Assuming we understand stellar evolution and how stars behave, then we can estimate the number of stars if we know how bright the galaxy is, because we know, roughly speaking, how bright an average star is. And we also know, roughly speaking, the mass of an average star. So if we know the brightness of a galaxy, we know the number of stars and the mass of all the stars. And hence, we know the mass of the galaxy. We have to make a correction for the fact that galaxies aren't just stars, they're also gas and dust, but we can do that. If we work out the mass of an individual galaxy, we can do that for all of the galaxies in the cluster, and hence we can obtain an estimate for the mass of the entire galaxy cluster. And that mass is presumably responsible for the gravity that's holding all of these galaxies together. So we've got an estimate of the mass and an estimate of the gravity. But even back in the 1930s, it was realized that the gravity calculated in this way is simply not enough to keep the cluster together. From the amount of luminous matter that appears to exist, from all the light we can see from all of these galaxies, there simply isn't enough mass to keep this system gravitationally bound. They should have drifted apart a long, long time ago. So it was realized nearly 100 years ago that something is wrong. Originally, it was called the missing mass problem. Using the luminosity to find the mass seems to underestimate the mass required to hold the galaxy cluster together, not just by a little bit. It's not just a few percent off. It's off by a factor of two or a factor of three or a factor of five. It's off by a huge amount. Here's a phrase that's going to keep cropping up. It's as if there is some additional mass that is not luminous because we can't account for it by simply looking at galaxy brightness. Some additional mass is providing the extra gravity that's needed to keep the cluster intact and bind the galaxies together. What are we going to call this additional mass? Well, let's call it dark matter. That's pretty cool. It's a bit of a misnomer because it's not dark in the sense that it doesn't absorb light. It would be better to call it transparent matter that neither absorbs light nor emits light. But that's a bit of a mouthful and dark matter is a lot catchier. And so that particular name has stuck. Let's look at a second piece of evidence. A few decades later, when looking at the rotation of galaxies, all galaxies rotate and we can ask the question, how fast are the stars moving in a galaxy? We can determine that using the Doppler effect. The fact that if an object is moving towards us, then the lines in its spectra or spectrum will be shifted towards the blue, whereas if the object is moving away from us, the lines in its spectra will be shifted towards the red. So schematically, we can think of it as that little cartoon on the right hand side. If we imagine that we've got a rotating spiral galaxy and some of the stars, like the stars close to A, are coming towards us, and on the other side, the stars close to C are moving away from us, then the stars on one side will be blue shifted and the stars on the other side will be red shifted. 
compared to stars at B, or any line of sight along that line B, which are moving horizontally relative to us, but neither towards nor away from us, they will not be shifted towards the blue or the red. So, if we choose the right galaxies, and if we look at enough stars, we can get a measure of how fast those stars are moving from the red or blue shift, the Doppler shift. The amount of the Doppler shift is simply proportional to the velocity of the stars. It's a relatively easy calculation to do. So we won't choose a galaxy that's face on, like this one, M51, simply because all the stars are rotating approximately in the plane of the disk of a spiral galaxy like this one, and hence they're all moving tangential to our line of sight. Very few of those stars are moving towards us or away from us. So we wouldn't choose a galaxy that is face on. If we chose one that's edge on, well, there certainly will be some stars moving towards us and some stars moving away from us. But notice that when we look at a galaxy that's exactly edge on, we tend to get a lot of dust in the plane of the galaxy, in the plane of the disk of the galaxy, and that dust tends to obscure the light from more distant stars. So face on is not suitable, absolutely edge on is not suitable, we'll, chose, we'll choose galaxies that are a more jaunty angle. And if we have a galaxy like this one, which we're seeing at an angle of perhaps somewhere closer to 45 degrees, then there will be some stars moving away from us and some stars moving towards us. If we imagine it's rotating in the sense indicated by the spiral arms, then we can guess that some stars will be blue shifted and some stars red shifted. So this on the right is only supposed to be schematic. It's not supposed to indicate that the stars will appear blue or appear red. It's simply which way will their spectra indicate that the lines have been shifted towards the blue or towards the red. So what would we expect to see if we measure a whole load of star velocities in a galaxy? What would we expect? How should the velocities of stars vary as we look at stars further and further from the centre of a galaxy? Well, if we think about the solar system, where the mass responsible for keeping all of the planets in their orbits, all of the mass is well inside the orbits themselves. Because remember, the Sun is much, much smaller than the orbit of Mercury, let alone the orbits of the other planets. And when we plot out the speed of planet motion as a function of distance, there's the distance from the Sun on the horizontal axis, the semi-major axis in astronomical units, so one is equal to the Earth, and we plot out the average speed, most planets move in ellipses rather than circles, but let's just sort of average that out and think about how fast these objects are moving in kilometers per second as a function of distance from the sun, we tend to find this curve that falls off, characteristically like this. If we wanted to, we could plot it on logarithmic axes and then it becomes a nice straight line, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna stick with simply plotting speed as a function of distance, then if we are talking about objects that are moving well away from the mass, if all of the mass is concentrated inside the orbit of these objects, then the speed of the objects ought to fall away like that. So what do we actually see when we plot this out for typical galaxies? Again, we're going to be measuring on the vertical axis the speed of the star's velocity. And on the horizontal axis, we're looking at the distance from the centre of the galaxy, here in thousands of light years. So when we're close to the centre, remember that's perhaps there's a supermassive black hole at the centre of the galaxy, maybe, maybe not. But of course, the amount of matter inside the orbit is going to increase a little bit as we get further and further away from the centre of the galaxy. So we don't expect the velocity to fall off originally, we would expect it to increase a little bit until we get to a certain point indicated by that red ellipse. Look at the, the luminosity of this galaxy. Most of the stars in this galaxy appear to be inside the red ellipse. We can't define the edge of the galaxy as such, but we can say, from the looks of it, 99% of the stars appear to be inside that red ellipse. So if we started to look at stars orbiting the centre of the galaxy at greater and greater distances, 20,000 light years or 25,000 light years, then we can expect the orbit of those stars, 
inside the orbit is essentially all of the matter, apparently, that's keeping those stars in orbit. So we would expect the velocity to start to tail off, as indicated by this dotted line. This is what we would expect based on the stars in the visible disk of the galaxy. So is this curve going to come down if we continue measuring velocities at greater and greater distances? Well, there aren't that many stars once you get beyond about 15 or 20,000 light years for this galaxy. So we don't actually measure the speed at which stars are moving. We pick something smaller, like hydrogen atoms. You might think that's a bit odd to go from something very large to very small, but according to Kepler's laws of how things orbit, it doesn't actually matter what the mass of the object itself is. The rate at which it moves, the speed of the object in the orbit, will depend only on the mass of the central object holding it in orbit. It doesn't actually matter whether the object itself is an atom or a star. So when we measure the speed of gas atoms as we go further and further away from the centre of the galaxy, does it start to drop off as indicated by the dotted line, which is what we would expect? Let's finish and see. Oh, no, it doesn't. It sometimes tails off and goes flat. Sometimes it just keeps on increasing. In other words, in this case, if we look up at the top right, there are atoms moving much, much faster than we would expect. In order to be held in position by the mass of all of the stars in the galaxy, we would expect their speed to be down here somewhere, below 50 kilometers per second. But when we measure it, we actually find it's up here, well above 100 kilometers a second. Atoms are moving much faster than we can explain based on the luminous matter that's providing the gravity within this galaxy. Here's that phrase again. It's as if there is some additional mass that is not luminous. We've already accounted for all the luminous mass in the galaxy by adding up all the stars, and that doesn't appear to be enough to hold these objects in orbit. Some additional mass is providing the extra gravity needed to keep the stars or the gas atoms orbiting at high velocities, even when they are a long way outside what we would say is the visible edge of the galaxy. Again, something must be providing the extra gravity, a second strand of evidence for the existence of dark matter. We can visualize what we mean by a little cartoon which shows a galaxy rotating. If a galaxy didn't have any dark matter, we would expect the stars close to the center to move relatively quick compared to the stars at the edge. The stars at the edge should be moving relatively slowly because they're a long way from the gravitational center. Whereas with dark matter, what we actually find is that stars near the center are moving quite fast and stars at the edge are moving almost as fast, in some cases at the same speed as stars that are much closer to the center. So in other words, without dark matter, we would expect the outer stars to move slowly, but if dark matter exists, then we can account for the outer stars moving faster. And what we observe is the right-hand cartoon, not the left-hand cartoon. Generally speaking, we do not see galaxies that look like the one on the left. We see galaxies that look like the one on the right. So we need to invoke the existence of dark matter to explain that rotation. Let's have a look at a third strand of evidence that dark matter exists. It's gravitational lensing. It's quite unlike the other two. Because we can calculate mass from its gravitational effect, not on galaxies in a cluster, which was strand number one, or stars orbiting within a galaxy, which was strand of evidence number two, we can calculate mass from its effect on light itself. Now, yes, I know, dark matter does not interact with light. It doesn't emit light and it doesn't absorb light, correct. But even though it doesn't emit or absorb light, dark matter has mass, and mass generates gravity which can bend light. And therefore the existence of dark matter can cause light not to follow what we would perceive as straight lines, but to bend through space through the existence of mass, if you prefer, distorting space-time. That's the way Einstein would think of it. 
So there's a little cartoon of what we think might be happening. There's a distant galaxy and it's on the other side of a large galaxy cluster which is sitting between this distant galaxy and us here on Earth. So rather than the light from this distant galaxy simply taking one route to arrive at Earth, it can take multiple routes because it's getting focused by this large mass. One way to think of it is to simply say this mass is behaving like a lens. Alternatively, you can say the mass of this cluster is distorting the fabric of space-time, that's this grid in the background, and that distortion of space-time is causing the light to bend and be focused, as if the galaxy cluster was a large lens bending the light. So the galaxy in the distance might be a very small object, but the lensed galaxy, because the lens is by no means a perfect lens, it gets a rather distorted image of this more distant galaxy. Although it's difficult to unwrap exactly what you would expect to get from the galaxy cluster. It's difficult to say if that is the galaxy I see then how much matter must there be in this galaxy cluster in order to bend space-time in such a way that it gives me the lensing effect that we observe for a particular distant galaxy. It's tricky but it's doable because it's effectively applying Einstein's general theory of relativity if we can figure out what the mass is, we can figure out what effect it would have on a distant galaxy. As I say, it's a non-trivial calculation to do, but thanks to supercomputers and a lot of very clever people, it is possible for a given observation of a distant galaxy to calculate how much matter must be present to give that particular result. Some of the distortion we see of distant galaxies is quite extreme. Here we get the galaxy, a distant galaxy, being distorted, distorted by this uh, foreground galaxy in the centre here. The more distant galaxy is distorted into what appears to be almost a circle, a huge horseshoe. How can we understand something getting quite so distorted? Well, you might well have seen something before along those lines that perhaps not really realising it. If you look at a distant light source, like a candle, if you look at it through the base of a wine glass, which is a rather imperfect lens, notice that the single source of light is now split into multiple sources of light by the lens of the base of the wine glass. And depending on the angle and the distance at which you hold the wine glass relative to the more distant candle flame, you might get multiple images, you might get arcs. And if you're very careful as to how you position the base of the wine glass, you might indeed get an entire circle, or at least a large fraction of a circle, like we saw a moment ago with the arc here of a distant galaxy imaged by this massive galaxy in the foreground. So seeing multiple images of distant galaxies, or arcs, or horseshoes, or circles, is something we can understand with an imperfect lens. So next time you're having a romantic candlelight dinner with your loved one, remember to hold the wine glass up to the candle and have a look for these effects. So the Hubble Space Telescope, and now the James Webb Space Telescope, has obtained lots of images of galaxy clusters in which in the distance you can see distortions of more distant galaxies. Here are a number of foreground galaxies looking a little bit yellowish, perhaps even a little bit greenish in this particular rendition. But in the distance you can see these blue streaks, which are various galaxies that are much more distant and have been distorted, stretched and streaked by the mass within the galaxy cluster which is sitting between us and the more distant galaxies. The distortion, it's tricky to work out the details, but the distorted images and the amount of distortion can be used to calculate the mass distribution within the lens, in other words within the galaxy cluster. And we find that the mass required to produce those distortions is more than we can account for from the luminous mass. If we look at all of the galaxies that are present and add up all of the stars that appear to be there, we can't get enough matter to explain the distortion we see. There we go again. It's as if there is some additional mass that is not luminous, 
that is providing the extra gravity that's needed to bend the light in the particular way that gives us those particular distortions of the more distant galaxies. Dark matter again. The fourth strand I'm going to skip over, but it is in the handout that I'll make available to you later if you're interested in following up the fourth strand of evidence. But these are all essentially independent observations and they all point to the existence of dark matter where the amount of dark matter needed is substantially more than the amount of visible matter that we can account for. So, OK, I hope you're convinced that there's evidence that something is out there. Yes, there's something out there that's not luminous, but what is it? There are two main candidates for the composition of dark matter, so-called machos and wimps. Machos, massive astrophysical compact halo objects, and wimps, weakly interacting massive particles. These particles were thought of first, perhaps we're missing some particles of all the particles that might exist other than the ones we are made of, the neutrons and protons and electrons that make up all the atoms and molecules in our bodies. Maybe there are some other particles that we're missing. They only interact weakly because they appear to produce gravitational effects but don't appear to interact with electromagnetic waves. So wimps came along and for those people with a certain sense of humour they thought well maybe it's not wimps and they sort of reverse engineered well maybe they are machos and they reverse engineered an acronym and said maybe it's objects that we haven't yet identified but they're not made of anything exotic they're made of ordinary matter but for some reason it doesn't emit light. So let's have a look at those two possibilities. What do we mean by a massive? Astrophysical compact halo object. Well, massive simply means that we're trying to find things which have got a significant amount of mass. Astrophysical means nothing other than it gives you the A of macho. And then we're talking about compact halo objects. A halo object is an object that exists in the halo of a galaxy. A halo, a large sphere surrounding a galaxy, uh, at a radii that could be anything from the visible size of the galaxy out to a few multiples of the radius of the galaxy. So if that's a halo object, what do we mean by compact? Well, we mean literally just small enough that we could have missed them. Compact objects such as, well, for instance, black holes. Could they be very small so that they're very difficult to see? They exist in the halo of a galaxy and they are massive enough to account for all of the dark matter we're looking for. Well, if they are objects that are composed of normal matter, and normal matter that could in principle emit light, but for some reason doesn't emit light, examples could be black holes or neutron stars or white dwarfs. Yes, neutron stars and white dwarfs do actually emit light, but white dwarfs only emit light because they are made rather hot, a white dwarf, like uh, our sun, eventually when it comes to the end of its life, once it's sloughed off its outer atmosphere, the central core will become a white dwarf and that is hot even though there are no nuclear reactions taking place. Over time that will cool off, so a white dwarf will become eventually a black dwarf. So is it possible that stellar sized objects are floating around out there and are too dark for us to see, but if we added them all up they would account for the amount of dark matter we're looking for. If they're dark, how can we detect them? Well, even if they're dark and we, they don't emit light that we can see, we could still in principle detect them using gravitational lensing. Not lensing on the galaxy scale, but lensing on the individual star scale. Gravitational microlensing. What's happening there? If we think about light coming from a distant star arriving at Earth, then for most of the time when we stare at that star, let's assume it's a star that's nice and stable and doesn't vary its brightness much. If we were to stare at that star, the star would appear the same brightness effectively as a, a constant as a function of time. But if a black hole happened to wander in between us and the distant star, in other words, if a black hole happened to wander into our line of sight, close to the line of sight with the star, as it got close to our line of sight, 
that black hole would produce some distortion of space and time and produce a lensing effect that would focus the light and temporarily that distant star would appear a little bit brighter. But only for as long as it had a black hole on our line of sight there. Once that black hole had drifted away because all stars are moving around the galaxy, we wouldn't expect any stars to be fixed in position. Therefore, an object that happens to wander in front of this star will eventually wander away and then the star will go back to its original brightness. So if we were to stare at a star then, if we suddenly saw it get brighter and then go back to its original brightness and stay there, that could be the signature of a compact object such as a black hole or a neutron star that happened to wander into our line of sight. So that was the general idea. Let's stare not at one star because that's uh, very unlikely that one black hole will wander in front of one star, but why don't we stare at a huge number of stars? This is roughly speaking what the Milky Way looks like from the side. Yes, this is a picture taken from Earth, so it's actually the picture of the Milky Way from the inside, but let's imagine this is a picture of the Milky Way with the bright central bulge, the flat disk, and there are Magellanic clouds sitting there in the Southern Hemisphere. If we imagine that we're here somewhere, if we were to look at stars in the Magellanic cloud, and if we were to stare at them, there were millions of stars there, if we were to measure their brightness and watch them for long enough, sooner or later, if there are black holes in this region floating around the halo of the galaxy, then sooner or later black holes are going to drift in between the line of sight between us in the disk of the galaxy and the large Magellanic clouds sitting out of the disk of the galaxy. There's plenty of space there for black holes to drift in front of our line of sight. So this experiment was done. The brightness of stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud were monitored over a period of time to see how many black holes drifted in front of these stars. And quite a few were found. But the bottom line is not enough. So there might be many, many billions of black holes floating around our galaxy. But a billion black holes isn't enough. We need a mass that's greater than the mass of all the stars and all the gas and all the dust in the galaxy. So machos do exist. They are there, but at best they can account for a few percent of the dark matter we're looking for. So machos do not appear to be the answer. Some people argue, well, maybe they are the answer, but we're just looking for machos of the wrong size. Maybe they're not stellar sized black holes. Maybe there's lots of tiny black holes. Perhaps, but they're going to be much more difficult to find. What about WIMPs? Weakly interacting massive particles. Particles that don't make up atoms. They're not the familiar protons, neutrons, electrons that make up atoms and molecules. It's something else that we've been missing for, well, forever because we didn't know they existed. They appear, apparently interact through gravity, so they have mass, so they interact through gravity, but they do not interact through electromagnetism. Hence, we cannot see them by light they emit or absorb. In a sense, they're similar to neutrinos. These are rather ghostly particles that behave in a similar way. But neutrinos are very light and move through the universe very quickly. These WIMPs, these weakly interacting massive particles, must be substantially heavier and moving rather more slowly. Presumably they must have been born in the Big Bang. It's difficult to think of how you can generate the WIMPs needed for dark matter after the Big Bang. And also, as I'll say towards the end of the talk, it looks like we need dark matter right from the off to understand how the universe has evolved. Maybe if dark matter has existed since the beginning of time, then the annihilation of dark matter and we know that every particle has an antiparticle, every electron has an anti-electron, protons have antiprotons, etc. So if a dark matter particle exists, presumably there is such a thing as an anti-dark matter particle. Hereafter I'll just use dm for dark matter. And presumably the annihilation of dark matter and the antiparticle equivalent uh, 
Well, they're going to be separated and not interacting very strongly now that they would presumably now the universe has expanded since the Big Bang. They're a long way apart and annihilation is going to be rare. But perhaps dark matter and anti-dark matter particles are concentrated in a gravity well like, for instance, the centre of the sun. So is it possible that WIMPs could be captured by the sun and is it worth looking for the signature of annihilation of dark matter and anti-dark matter particles that we predict would generate neutrinos? So the search for dark matter could be either let's look for the dark matter particle directly or let's look for a proxy of the dark matter particle, which could be the neutrinos that are generated when we think dark matter particles annihilate. So there are a number of experiments that exist around the world that are looking either directly for dark matter or looking for neutrinos, and I'll briefly describe some of them. One of them is the so-called LZ, or if you're American, the LZ experiment, whereby a tank of xenon is used to see can we detect a dark matter particle coming into the tank and hitting an, at an atom. So here's a little video giving an indication of what's actually going on. There is a tank of xenon, uh, quite a few tons of it, about uh, 10 tons or so of xenon. It's called the Lux Zeppelin experiment, the LZ experiment, because it's an amalgamation of two earlier experiments, Lux and Zeppelin. And the idea is if a dark matter particle comes in, it might strike an atom and produce a flash of light and release some electrons. And those electrons are then drifting up to the top under an electric field where they produce another flash of light. So dark matter produces a particular signature if it strikes an atom in this tank of the uh, liquid gas called xenon. But there's going to be lots of other things happening. Cosmic rays are also going to produce results. So this tank of xenon is set inside a shield to try and minimise the amount of radiation coming from outside. And the entire tank and shield are inside a tank of water, again, to reduce external uh, effects. The entire lot is at the bottom of a mine shaft a mile below ground, such that the effect of cosmic rays will be minimised. The amount of cosmic rays that get one mile below ground is going to be relatively small. So maybe that experiment will reveal the existence of dark matter particles. There are other experiments that aren't necessarily looking for dark matter, but are looking for the characteristic neutrinos, which may be a telltale sign of the existence of dark matter. One of them is the Super Kamiokande experiment, which is going to be upgraded to the Hyper Kamiokande experiment in due course. This is a large tank of water, and when I say large, the tank of water is something like 50,000 tonnes. Just for scale, there's a couple of people on the same scale as this tank of water. How do we detect neutrinos as they flash through a tank of water? Well, we can detect the existence of these particles, even though they don't interact very strongly with matter. We can see them, in a sense, in the same way that if a plane travels through air faster than sound can travel through air, what do we see? We see a shock wave generated, in a sense, because the air can't get out of the way. So if the plane is moving through air faster than sound through air, we get a sonic boom. And there's an optical equivalent to that. If a particle moves through a medium faster than light can travel through that medium, we get the photonic equivalent of a sonic boom, and it's called Cherenkov radiation or Cherenkov light. And remember that there's no reason why a particle can't travel faster than light through a medium. Remember, particles can't travel faster than light in a vacuum. But when you're travelling through air or water, the light gets slowed down a little bit and the particles, if they're going fast enough, can travel faster than light can travel through that medium. And that produces a characteristic blue light. That's why nuclear reactors, if you look at the either cooling ponds or the radiation around the core of a nuclear reactor, they tend to glow blue. That's not just Hollywood doing it for artistic effect, that is Cherenkov radiation. So if a particle comes through this tank, it can generate Cherenkov radiation, which produces a blue flash, which gets picked up by photodetectors that are lining the inside walls of this water tank. 
and depending on which photo detectors are lit up, you can backtrack where did that neutrino come from and see if they came from, for instance, the sun, indicating that that might be a source of neutrinos other than the neutrinos we're aware of coming from the nuclear reactions in the sun. Maybe it's coming from dark matter annihilation. That's what the inside of the tank looks like when the water has been taken down a little bit. And if you're having trouble with the scale and trying to work out what that little thing there is, well, that's basically uh, a couple of men in a dinghy. Gives you an idea of the scale of this particular water tank and the sheer number of these photo detectors which are lining the floor, the ceiling and the inside curved wall of this huge cylindrical tank. There's what the detector looks like, not this particular one in Super Cameo Candy, but a similar detector that's used in a, an experiment in which the water is not in liquid form as it is, is in the Super Cameo Candy experiment in Japan, but at the South Pole there's a so-called ice cube experiment where the laboratory itself is sitting on top of the ice pack, but the experiment actually is an instrumented cube of ice. They have drilled into the ice and put those photo detectors like a string of pearls into a cube of ice that's effectively one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. And if you're having trouble with the scale, there's the Eiffel Tower to the same scale of what we're talking about here. That's the bedrock of Antarctica. There's the ice cap. And this one kilometer cube is below about one kilometer of ice, again, to restrict the amount of background radiation that could possibly affect the results. Regarding any neutrinos passing through this ice, the neutrinos and the Cherenkov radiation that results, they really don't care whether the water is in solid form or liquid form. So it makes no difference whether it's a water tank or an ice cube as far as the physics is concerned. As well as being concentrated in the sun, being a gravity well, a local gravity well in our solar system, it's also thought that if WIMPs exist, might they collect in another gravity well, not the one at the centre of our solar system, but what about the centre of the Milky Way, that where there is a supermassive black hole with a mass of many millions of solar masses, is it possible that dark matter is collecting there? In which case, annihilation is thought to produce gamma rays, and then there are experiments to look for these gamma rays, again as a proxy for does that tell us about the existence of dark matter perhaps at the centre of our Milky Way. So again, when we think about the shape of our Milky Way, the centre of our Milky Way is in the constellation of Sagittarius to Scorpius, that sort of region of the sky, which we know is rather low down as seen from, for instance, the United Kingdom and other places in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you want to actually see what's going on in the centre of the galaxy, you would position your observatory in the Southern Hemisphere. So there are plans to build the Cherenkov Telescope Array, mainly in Chile, but also some telescopes in the uh, Northern Hemisphere as well, such that we should be able to pick up what's going on from the centre of the galaxy. So again, it's Cherenkov radiation, this time in the atmosphere rather than in water or in ice. So any high energy particles coming into the atmosphere, they might be travelling so fast, depending on their energy, that they'll be travelling through the air faster than light can travel through the air and will produce a characteristic blue flash as they enter the atmosphere. And these Cherenkov telescopes will be looking not to where this particle has come from, but will be looking for the flash such that they can backtrack and work out that this particle came from a particular part of the sky and then they can figure out does that appear to be coming from the centre of the Milky Way or from a different part of the sky. Now there are lots of other experiments, I'm not going to go through the details, but there's lots of acronyms for lots of experiments that exist trying to look directly for the weakly interacting massive particles, the WIMPs themselves. For instance, using semiconductor crystals such that an 
wimp that comes in and kicks an atom might produce vibrations that can be detected. In other cases, they're hoping that a wimp which hits an atom will make the atom recoil and produce a very short track. In this one, which I think takes the, uh, takes the prize for the best acronym, Picasso, the project in Canada to search for supersymmetric objects. Basically, they're looking for signs of objects, particles that are coming through and changing liquid in their detector to gas, which produces a tiny little shock wave, which they hope to detect. So again, I'm not going to talk about the details. I'm just giving you the acronyms. And again, these will be in the handout if anybody wants to go and check these for themselves. There are lots of other laboratory based attempts to directly measure dark matter. So here's a few of them around Europe and elsewhere. There's lots of these experiments on the go. They've, some of them have been operating for many years. A lot of these experiments have seen interesting results, but many are either contradictory or simply have not yet been confirmed to be indications of having found a dark matter particle. So in that sense, the jury is still out. I've been talking about machos and wimps, but perhaps there are alternatives. Maybe there's a third possibility, uh, and I'm not talking about other possible particles. Some people think wimps might not exist, and maybe there's another hypothetical particle which exists called an axion, which might explain the existence of dark matter. But here I'm talking about a third possibility, which is neither a particle nor a macho, nor an astrophysical object. Maybe we have simply misunderstood the way that gravity works. Hence, we only seem to need dark matter because if we're applying what we think is our understanding of gravity, there appears to be a deficit of mass. But maybe that's just because we've got the maths wrong. Not the maths wrong, the mathematics of how we account for gravity. Maybe gravity works differently on different scales. So maybe the gravity of how the universe works is not the same thing as how gravity works on a, t on a distant scale comparable to the galaxy. And again, it would be different on a scale of the solar system or on the scale of the Earth or a laboratory experiment which tries to measure the gravitational attraction of two masses. If gravity is not universal but operates differently on different scales, then it's possible to engineer a hypothesis in which you can say, if we take this hypothesis, then we don't need dark matter. This is the so-called modified Newtonian dynamics or MOND. However, if you start tinkering with gravity in order to eliminate the need for dark matter in clusters of galaxies, unfortunately, you still need dark matter within galaxies. And if you tinker with gravity so you don't need it within a galaxy, you still need it on the larger scale. In other words, nobody has got MON to work on all scales such that we can eliminate the need for dark matter on all scales that we can observe. In other words, it gets rid of some problems, but it generates a whole load of new ones. So some people still believe MON is a contender. Many believe it's just got too many problems to be viable. So the final point, does it matter? Who cares? Maybe there's stuff out there that we haven't been able to see. Would the universe be any different if it wasn't there? If the universe was only the stars and the gas and the dust and everything else we can see, would the universe still have evolved the same way? Well, simulations allow us to start with the matter of the Big Bang and running simulations of how we think gravity works, we can see whether or not we get galaxy distributions similar to what we see. In other words, when we look out into the universe with space telescopes or even ground-based telescopes, we see a certain distribution of galaxies throughout the universe. They're not uniformly spread. We see galaxies in clusters. We see them in clusters that seem to be along filaments, and we see a sort of web type structure with a few voids over here where there are very few galaxies and some lots of clusters of super clusters of galaxies in other areas. And we can simulate these galaxy distributions, but only if we include dark matter in the simulations. 
if we try a simulation starting with all of the matter that we know exists, all of the hydrogen, the helium, all of the gas and dust, etc., if we take all of that into account but don't include dark matter in the simulations, then the universe doesn't clump enough. In the 13.8 billion years that we think we've existed as a, as a universe, we believe the universe is 13.8 billion years old, simulations can't get matter to clump correctly, or at least enough, to explain the existence of galaxies similar to the ones we see, unless we put dark matter in the mix. We know the universe is expanding, and currently the observable universe is some 100 billion light years or so in diameter. And according to our models of how the universe has evolved, everything that we currently see in that 100 billion light year diameter sphere, all of that material used to be a lot closer together. If we wind the clock back far enough, all of that matter currently in the observable universe used to be separated by just a few centimetres. It's impossible to get your head around how dense that must have been, but that is what we believe the early universe looked like. And just like a golf ball has dimples, when the universe that we currently call the observable universe, when all of that was so close together it was only the size of a golf ball, that would also have had dimples. Not dimples in the surface like in a golf ball, but dimples in the sense of variations in density and temperature across the entire sphere. And it's those small variations in density and temperature which, over billions of years, gravity started to condense the more dense regions and that density differential between the densest and the least dense regions would have been exaggerated from a relatively smooth and uniform state back when the universe was only this size. If you run the clock forward, and that's what this simulation is doing, excuse me, if you run this simulation, a particular chunk of the universe, fill it with matter and dark matter, and then let gravity do its stuff, the brighter regions are the denser regions, and this is where galaxies are forming. Something that started relatively uniform after a few billion years becomes very clumpy. Notice that some regions now have huge superclusters of galaxies. Some galaxies appear to be spread along lines, these filaments. And there are some regions of the universe which appear to be almost devoid of galaxies, these so-called voids. So this filamentary structure, this web structure that we see in this simulation, that's pretty much what we actually see when we look out into the universe to see how the galaxies are distributed. But these simulations only produce these results if we have dark matter in the mix. What we think is happening is gravity is getting a hold of this dark matter, pulling the dark matter together. The dark matter tends to collect in certain regions and then the hydrogen and helium basically plough up down by getting funnelled by these filaments. The ordinary matter ends up getting funnelled along these filaments and bundling in after the dark matter is originally condensed into particular knots of these filaments in the web structure. So effectively dark matter structures form first and then all the hydrogen structures and what we see as the galaxies and the stars come later. You need one to form the other. So this is the large scale structure on the universe. This again is a simulation, but on the largest of scales, if we were to zoom into this foamy or web structure that we see, we see individual galaxy uh, clusters and super galaxy clusters. And if we zoom in further, we start to see individual galaxies. But we cannot understand the existence of these structures unless dark matter is in the original mix. So why is it dark? Because of the way it interacts or doesn't interact with light. The evidence, I've given you three strands of evidence, the way galaxies behave, the way stars behave, and gravitational lensing. And I'll deal with the cosmic uh, background in a handout so you can see that one as well. And we think it's either machos or wimps. Perhaps it's a different particle that we haven't quite figured out yet. Perhaps it is machos, but we're looking for the wrong sized machos. Maybe they are different size black holes that we should be looking for. But the bottom line is 
yes it matters because cosmic evolution would not have worked out the way it did and we would not be here and you would not be listening to me unless dark matter existed. Thank you for listening.